This is a limited series of the Rational Reminder podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making focused on cryptocurrencies. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode five of this mini crypto series that we're doing. And today we take a bit of a different uh, perspective on crypto. I think it's safe to say it's a bit of a skeptical view, which is important to hear all different sides of the thinking on cryptocurrencies. And we welcomed Stephen Deal to the podcast. Yes, yeah, Stephen is a software engineer. He, he's worked in the financial sector and on financial technology. So he, he does have a, a pretty interesting perspective, both from the software engineering side, but also from a, a, a pretty intimate knowledge of the inner workings of existing financial systems. Now, like you said, Cameron, he, he is a skeptic. I, I, I'll, I'll willingly admit that there is a skeptical undertone of most of the conversations that we're having in this in this series. Uh, now, I think that's true of all of our podcast episodes, period. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit of a skeptical undertone. Uh, I, I guess we are generally pretty skeptical. But Stephen takes us to a, di- a whole a whole different uh, a whole different level. He he is a uh, an extreme skeptic or or critic and um, outspoken. Very outspoken very on his outspoken. Twitter feed. Yeah. So he, he won't hesitate to tell you that crypto is an outright scam. And he's written extensively on that topic on his own blog and, and on uh, other other platforms. He's very active on Twitter. I think he probably tweets that crypto is a scam daily or, or some variation of that. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I don't think that he's just being, uh, you know, mean to crypto people. He, we talked to him about this in, in our conversation. He feels like he has a duty to get this message out uh, as someone who, well, he, he believes that what he's speaking is the, is the truth. Um, so I think that's, that's probably important to, uh, to know about him. I, I, I appreciate that he brings a perspective of a professional software engineer, uh, like on the technology side. I think he has a very, uh, a very good understanding. Yeah. But he, he, he also brings... Uh, what I would probably describe as more of a passion because he's, he's not necessarily an expert on, on the economics or the, the social aspects, uh, but he's clearly spent a lot of time reading and understanding uh, how all of those things play into this and, and whether the economics of crypto, for, for example, are revolutionary. And I think that he, like probably us, have, has concluded that it's maybe not revolutionary, even, even if there, there are maybe some interesting ideas that have come out of it. Uh, anyway, so I, I think he brings a very critical, uh, but well thought out perspective on, uh, on crypto. I agree. So with that, let's go to our conversation from London, England with Stephen Deal. Stephen Deal, welcome to- Guys, thanks for having me today. It's a pleasure. Stephen, to start, can you describe public blockchain technology? So public blockchain technology um, is a technology that's rooted in what I would call a large financial reconfiguration project based on a great deal of kind of myth-making about the value of reinventing private money from first principles. So this includes technologies such as like, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum. These are kind of large networks uh, that people have deployed Uh, with the aim of creating new forms of private money that can exist outside of the remit of like nation states um, and or or internet native money. And that's the original aim of the project. And um, what the project has morphed into over the last 13 years is actually kind of open to some large amount of debate, but public blockchain technology um, is largely um, a project to reinvent money from first principles. So what problem are public blockchains trying to solve? Well, primarily the ideations of the original movement came out of a very kind of um, a belief that uh, the private sector should be the source of money, that um, the financial system itself had become too, you know, corrupt and calcified, um, and that the events of the financial crisis um, gave us reason to kind of think about new foundations for a new financial system. 
uh, that was detached from the kind of legacy institutions of banks and you know central banks and nation states. Uh, and so it's really much rooted in a very kind of like anti-state kind of libertarian ideology. Um, and since then, public blockchains have largely become, I wouldn't say they become, they started off as an ambition to build a new payment rail system. Um, but what's happened over the last, I'd say, 13 years is that largely the narrative around this as an asset has been changed from a payment system um, into creating some sort of new speculative asset class. Uh, and the exact properties of those things are going to vary between the different types of products that people issue on these public blockchains. But the project now has become um, largely about creating new assets that people can um, invest in. Um, and those assets have some rather strange properties that we can get into in later details. But uh, that's that's the essence of where they're at today. Can you describe proof of work consensus and how it how it tries to eliminate the need for a trusted third party in transactions? Yeah. So the first uh, public blockchain project is called Bitcoin, and Bitcoin um, is an attempt to create a completely like censorship resistant money that exists outside of like the regulatory perimeter and outside of the remit of like nation states. And it does this by applying a very clever trick, um, which basically we create sort of a lottery system that runs on computers across the world that all race to solve mathematical puzzles. Um, and the probability of you winning the lottery is proportional to the amount of you know, compute time that you spend trying to solve the problem. So you could think of it like the more lottery tickets you buy, the more likely you are to win, right? Um, so proof of work basically does that on a very large scale using this kind of clever trick to create this completely fair, basically function that assigns a winner to one computer every 10 minutes. Um, and since the process is basically completely random as to who wins, um, this means that no one party is privileged in their ability to confirm the transactions that go onto the payment network. Um, and once transactions are confirmed by the winner of this, what's called a proof of work lottery, um, that creates basically a new financial history in that sort of 10 minute window about the, you know, the transactions that are committed to this kind of global uh, ledger of transactions. Um, so proof of work is an extremely controversial topic because by nature, it's sort of wasteful by design. Um, it's about basically expending large amounts of compute time and therefore energy and therefore largely like fossil fuels uh, to basically power large data centers um, to run this lottery system um, for the purpose of basically guaranteeing that no one party has control over the entire network. Um, and that's really the kind of clever trick that uh, Bitcoin invented. And people have kind of modified variations of this algorithm in different projects throughout time. Uh, but that's the essence of how it kind of gets its kind of very, very special property that makes it kind of resistant to tamper and from interference from large actors. Are there any other downsides to proof of work? It's extremely slow. So if you look at like traditional payment rails that we have like in SIPA and like ACH and like Visa, right? These are all run by central parties that run by a company like Visa and they you know, they batch up large transactions from payment terminals and, you know, they commit them to some, some global source of truth um, on a much more frequent basis. Um, and those can, can process, you know, hundreds of thousands of transactions, you know, a minute, right? Um, we're very good at building really, really fast payment networks now, at least in, in most Western countries. So Bitcoin tries to solve this in a very strange way because it wants to be censorship resistant. It wants to basically resist outside actors from having any kind of say about like what transactions get committed. Uh, whereas like a visa is a regulated entity that basically has to comply with laws and, you know, consumer demands and fraud detection and all that. Um, so the proof of work system is extremely slow. It can process about three to four transactions a second. Um, so that's, you know, not at the scale of what most kind of, you know, domestic payment rails can do in the world. Um, and so that fundamentally limits the kind of fundamental scalability of the entire system to basically be, you know, at the level of like uh, enough transactions to run like a small supermarket, but not to run like a nation state. 
and that's just a trade-off, right? Like I think the in in Bitcoin, um, I think proponents may not even see that as a downside. It's just like we we've decided we want censorship resistance, and therefore we have slower or fewer transactions over over time. It's a trade-off, yeah, exactly. Does uh, does proof of stake or or any of the other consensus mechanisms that have developed improve on the problems that proof of work has? So proof of stake is a variant on the algorithm um, by which all of these networks issue their own sort of native token, which you could think of as their flavor of private money. Um, and so in a proof of stake algorithm, um, participants participate in a lottery, but instead of it being proportional to the amount of servers and compute time you allocate toward winning the lottery, it's proportional to how many of the virtual asset you stake. Um, in the system, and then that basically runs the same kind of lottery system. And then um, whoever happens to win the lottery gets to be able to commit the, the block of transactions to the network. So the problem with both proof of work and both um, proof of stake is that they're both um, they're both arise um, out of sort of the economics of this the structure is that they both um, end up having the property that in proof of work basically you have all these people that are running large data centers and they have large electricity bills and you can't pay your electricity bills in Bitcoin. So you're forced to basically cash out of the system to pay your electricity bills to maintain the system. So that means the entire system is basically negative sum, right? And with proof of stake, you have the same kind of process by which the, the tokens that are locked up in the staking mechanism means that the economics of the entire thing are completely deflationary. Right, so uh, the amount of money available basically has to monotonically go down, um, and so both of them have this kind of baked-in fixed supply deflationary economics, uh, which is very different than your average kind of you know national currency, which tends to be inflationary. Um, and so part of the I guess appeal of things like Bitcoin and proof of stake coins is that they are deflationary assets. Um, the supply will only go down over time. And that's to its proponents, that's actually uh, a feature. And to its critics, that's a, a flaw. Hmm. Do you give up anything else with proof of stake relative to proof of work? Proof of stake doesn't have the environmental footprint, uh, but it's basically a form of like plutocracy, basically hmm. you know, rule by the wealthy. Um, who literally get to influence the um, the commitments of transactions to the network? So it's if you look at the ideological framework that the Bitcoin network was created out of, it was you know we want to replace the big banks or we want to replace you know payment processors or money services businesses, and so with a proof of stake network, you basically just replace one set of stakeholders for another set of stakeholders in a process that some critics call like recentralization. We've not created something new. You've just like recentralized. Like we had Visa before. Now we have a bunch of you know large token holders that control the entire network. And so like the decentralization narrative kind of fails, falls apart in that kind of situation. I, I've heard that one. And is it is it worse in proof of stake than it is is in proof of work? Because in both cases you end up with like we have a big concentration of miners in in proof of work. Is there a reason proof of stake is worse from the recentralization perspective, or are they similar? Well, in the proof of stake, the rewards that you get for winning the lottery are more tokens. So by design, you're basically incentivizing people to stake tokens, at which point then they can get more tokens for basically confirming and staking their transactions. So it results in consolidation by design. That's how the economics of it just work. I mean, basically stake tokens to get more tokens. And so like, this is only ever going to lead to kind of like a, if you look at the Gini coefficient of like what these things are going to look like over time, it can only result in sort of plutocracy and sort of a, you know, I guess like crypto aristocracy, if you will. Right. As a, as a software engineer, under what circumstances would you use a Byzantine fault tolerant distributed system like a public blockchain to solve a, a problem? Okay, so let's define some terms for the audience. A Byzantine fault-tolerant system is basically um, a network that's resistant to um, collusions of different parties to manipulate the system, right? So you want to basically... A consensus algorithm basically is a means of having everybody agree about a specific piece of data or a database, 
Um, and so Byzantine tolerance basically means that um, it's resistant against um, collusion attacks on the network. Um, so this is a very niche technology. Um, you'd only use this in environments in which the people who are participating in your network are not trusted. And so you want to create this game theoretic mechanism by which there's no incentive for them um, to collude. That's a really niche thing that doesn't occur all that much because in normally in like traditional financial services, like financial parties are, you know, they engage in contracts with each other that limit their kind of behavior. And you have like a governing law and it says that if some party does something malicious, then there's a recourse in the courts or something, right? So it's very rare that we have completely malicious environments and people want to transact with each other and they need to use technology to solve the problem. Typically we just use legal framework and the courts and contracts. Um, so coming from somebody who's worked in market infrastructure and in payments before, um, these don't occur that naturally. Um, and I can't think of a single use case where I would use something like a public blockchain because this is just not something that occurs in like normal B2B software. So you mentioned you work in financial technology. What problems with the current financial system do these public blockchains solve? Well, I don't think that the benefits of public blockchain technologies really amount to much. Um, they become a speculative asset that people will trade. And that appeals to a certain number of people because they want to they like the asset class and they want to add it to their portfolio for various reasons. Um, but it's ultimately a fundamentally a negative sum asset class. So like every single person that makes money off of it, you know, ultimately corresponds to multiple people who lost money off of it. So it's not productive. It's like, it's a negative sum game. Um, so from an investment perspective, it's not really solving a problem. It's not really great at payment rail system because it's too slow and doesn't scale. Right. And there are better payment mechanisms. Um, so as a speculative asset, it's completely uninteresting and, and it doesn't really provide payment infrastructure. So I think the value it's adding to the world is almost entirely illusory. Um, it's becoming a kind of speculative gambling product and that appeals to a certain class of people, but fundamentally it's not a big value add to society or to like, to my industry really. Hmm. Well, one of the defining features of cryptocurrencies is finality of payments. That's like, if I give you a $20 bill, you take it and that payment is final um, and you can recreate that to an extent with digital currencies, uh, which is kind of interesting, I guess. Is, is that considered a good thing in a payment system though? Not generally. Um, you want transaction reversal in the case of fraud. Um, you want to do like, you know, mitigation uh, in the case of like there's some sort of externality to the payment that needs to be reversed. Um, you want to have a trusted third party that basically mediates the transaction so that if something goes wrong with it, that you can reverse it and that there's some sort of you know entity that you have legal recourse to in the case of either fraud or reversal. Um, so you know, I don't fundamentally see what creating like a digital cash like system um, really buys. I mean, cash serves a purpose in our society for doing very low volume transactions privately. Uh, but like for most, you know, most transactions that you would do, you'd probably want to use like a credit card and then have like a trusted third party like Visa or Amex kind of mediate the whole thing because then you have somebody to go to when there's problems. So I don't see much benefit to this kind of digital cash system, except in some very extreme externalities where it's like, I need to send money to some, you know, dissident and, some country where the government has capital controls or something, but these are so extreme as to be almost completely irrelevant to most people in day-to-day -day lives. And that kind of leads to my next question. So we've heard that you know, cryptocurrencies are supposed to improve the efficiency of sending money internationally. What are the limitations on the international money transfers now in the current traditional banking system that it's looking to fix or improve on? So I think this goes to a big misnomer about the technology is that somehow this is going to provide like a means for doing faster international payments. 
And the limitations in international payments these days are not technical problems. Um, the reason that money takes a while to transfer uh, is usually due to compliance um, or regulatory overhead, basically that the bank has to approve you know, your transaction. And you know, ultimately when the money actually does move, it basically just changes two numbers in two banks' databases. And that happens almost as fast as you can up in a database. So it's not a technology problem to be solved. So now if you talk about like the remittance industry, that's a big industry, like those massive amounts of money that people send to family abroad. And so say like you're sitting on dollars in the United States, and I'm sitting on pound sterling here in Britain, right? Um, it's unclear to me that if you want to send, you know, sterling to me from dollars, that introducing a third intermediate currency in this entire process actually has any value add. It's better just to swap you know, dollars for sterling rather than go from like dollars to Bitcoin to sterling because in the middle you have this kind of hyper volatile speculative asset that you're using to exchange. Why not just straight go straight from dollars to sterling? It doesn't add any value. And then basically if you're running that money services business for the remittance, all you have added is basically just like the price risk of something that sits in the middle of that transaction for no reason. So the remittance use case for crypto doesn't seem to really match my lived experience of seeing how those things actually work in practice. I guess what it does give you is the, um, it, it because it can operate outside of the regulatory and legal system, all of the checks and balances normally required for sending money, which might cause delays or fees or whatever, you can bypass that, but you're bypassing it by <laughs> bypassing the legal system, which may, maybe has other problems. And, and maybe that part doesn't last forever either. I think the best example of what you're saying there is that like, you know, the Canadian convoy that's happening up in Canada, um, you know, they solicited a lot of international donations um, from, from people abroad um, and they were able to get, you know, all of the Bitcoin pooled in one address. But then when they go to actually like take that Bitcoin out into Canadian dollars, they find the government's basically blocked the, the final transaction. So they're stuck with a bunch of Bitcoin that they can't actually cash out. And they can't actually spend it on like petrol or on food or actually doing anything. And so if you want to send money like outside of the regulatory perimeter to a country that's hostile, you know, you still can't use the Bitcoin to actually buy anything because the government's going to restrict the withdrawal into the national currency at the end point. And so fundamentally, all of these kind of money movements and remittance problems that operate outside the regulatory perimeter, like you still need to go from, you know, national currency or to national currency. And that's not really a, a means to bypass that because the state always has control over domestic money services businesses. Yeah, that one, that one was super interesting because uh, I think that they also filed an injunction where separate from cashing out or, or, or uh, leaving the, the crypto sphere and going into the, to regular government money, um, I think even they, they made it so that even interacting with that wallet was punishable by by prison based on the injunction that was filed. So it's like, even if you find a way to spend it in Bitcoin, if you do that, you're breaking the law and the law still matters to you because you still live in Canada. <laughs> yeah, I thought that one was pretty interesting. Um, how do you prevent double spending, uh, which is one of the problems that proof of work consensus solved in a system without a consensus mechanism? You have a trusted third party that creates a single source of truth about transactions. And if there's any kind of problems, then you know you solve it with some sort of dispute resolution process. So the double spend problem is only a thing if you want to basically create like um, a distributed system of computers that need to agree about some data that can't be duplicated. This isn't a problem in centralized you know, trusted third-party systems that run payment rails. It's just, it's an odd issue over there by design. Hmm. Public blockchains and the cryptocurrencies that serve them have exploded clearly in number and value, like since Bitcoin was created. What do you think is the core innovation that's really driving this? Well, as a skeptic, I think there's no innovation. I think it's similar to what we've seen throughout history, there's a lot of market manias and 
the defining feature of market mania is when people start trading things kind of detached from their fundamental value based purely on the fact that they think they can offload it on a greater fool. Um, and that's just part of market structure that's happened, you know, ever since, you know, the invention of capitalism, you know, in like the early markets back in the 1700s in London, you know, um, tulip manias and, you know, beanie babies. Um, so if I look at the opinion of a lot of people I respect in the industry, you know, I think eight of the last Nobel Prize winners in economics have described, you know, the crypto phenomenon as a speculative bubble. You know, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, George Soros, they all say this thing looks like a bubble and I'm, I'm inclined to agree. I can't quite figure out how to actually value these things as an asset. And there seems to be a lot of speculative hype that's kind of detached from an underlying reality. So my thesis is that largely it's a market bubble. It, it does have bubble-like characteristics. The, the, the interesting thing about it is that it, it, it created a mechanism where financial assets could be created outside of the re regulatory system. Um, and that is maybe not a net positive innovation, but it's, it's still, it's still an innovation. Like, Hey, we can mint these assets now that, that can't be regulated, or at least they're, they're resistant to regulation and censorship. Yeah. I mean, the purpose of public blockchains is to create sort of asset bubbles. Um, now every teenager can go in their you know basement and create some sort of dog money from scratch. And then the whole thing can get up to a very large size where it can, you know, attract, you know, billions of dollars in investment. Uh, that's a very strange phenomenon. I guess it is an innovation of sorts, but it's all, it's a very frothy sort of bubbly bath of things that we don't know how to value that's pop out of nowhere. And uh, it's a very strange thing. We've never seen this before in markets. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so we've talked about pub public blockchains being distributed systems. And decentralization, of course, being one of the core attractions of Bitcoin since it was created. Practically speaking, is Bitcoin decentralized? Well, this goes to the fact that decentralized is kind of a buzzword. Um, in a computer science perspective, um, yes, the network is decentralized. It has a distributed topology. The code actually does function in a centralized manner. In practice, if you kind of layer on the incentives that fall out of the network, is that most of the mining that's actually done on Bitcoin um, is done in these large consolidated mining pools that are basically owned by like, you know, three Chinese entrepreneurs. Um, and they control basically like 90% of the total mining capacity. So they run just these massive data centers because economies of scale means that like it's not worth it for your average person to kind of run their own Bitcoin mining rig anymore. You have to have these massive data centers that consume vast amounts of power. And you can position them right near very, very cheap sources of petrol. So that happens in places like Kazakhstan and Siberia, where it is like basically these companies basically just run these things. But from an outside perspective, that means that you basically have like three folks that are basically, you know, running a giant company that controls 90% of the mining, really? right? So that's not very decentralized. That's basically just this massive sort of Russian money services business that basically processes most of the transactions. And, uh, you know, that doesn't look very decentralized to me. That looks very much like you've just recreated Visa, but worse. We, we've touched on bits and pieces of this, but I want to, I want to just key in for a second on the the mining power can you can you just talk about what the what the miners are doing and why a concentration in mining power uh is a is a negative thing from the perspective of decentralization so um, the concentration of mining power is from the fact that uh, it behooves people to basically run massive amounts of these data centers where all of the returns from winning the lottery get pulled into one entity where they can use those you know, those winnings from winning the, the block lottery to basically fuel the data center, which they can use to purchase cheap power. So it's just a pure economies of scale argument. Um, why this, it's just more efficient to consolidate all of your servers in one room and just pool the money around a common enterprise rather than having this kind of massively decentralized network of individuals doing this. And that's just a basic argument from economics, right? Um, and so that's what's happening. Mining pools are massively centralized now. Hmm. So some companies are talking about using a variation of public blockchains run by uh, 
a set of trusted parties. So do these permissioned blockchain systems improve on the shortcomings of, of these public blockchains? So there are these things called permission blockchains and they exist, but they exist in a kind of whole different ontological category of software because while the public blockchains are trying to like reinvent money from first principles, these permission blockchains primarily exist to basically do like enterprise data management problems where you have a bunch of people that need to have a single source of truth about some set of data because they're business partners or they're trading partners. And so they basically set up the system that acts kind of like a, a quorum that you know basically collects a bunch of data and creates a single golden source of truth out of it. Uh, but typically in the permission blockchains, there's no token, there's no speculation. It's basically just a way of reconciling data between a bunch of you know, companies. And so that's a very fundamentally different beast altogether. Um, so permission blockchains don't have necessarily a great track record. They are a solution that some people have used, but they're kind of controversial because diverse approximation, they're basically the same thing as running like a Microsoft SQL server, <laughs> which is like a regular database that you can buy from Microsoft today and just replicating that a bunch, a bunch of parties. And that would also work as a solution. So the permissioned blockchain solution seems to be like kind of a solution in search of a problem in most cases. Hmm. That's interesting. So y you could solve what a private blockchain is trying to solve using existing technology. Are there any other differences? Like is, is it is a private blockchain more efficient or is it more reliable, anything like that? Typically it's worse. It's actually slower and harder to use. Um, so there's not a lot of success stories around permission blockchains. Like IBM used to have a big division that used to do this stuff. They've kind of mostly spun it down. Oracle still solves, you know, uh, serves a few of these kind of prototypes that they've stood up. But it's just the first approximation. It's just strictly worse than using traditional solutions. And there's not a lot of success stories about permission blockchains being terribly useful. So, I mean, I still see media releases from large companies bragging about their use or their intended use of, of permission blockchains. Why do you think that's happening? <laughs> well, okay, so let's let's talk about how the sausage gets made in enterprise software a little bit. Um, companies that do these kind of things, typically it's, it's in some innovation department inside of some corporate. And innovations inside of corporates do very strange things. Sometimes they basically bring in external parties to kind of explore new and developing solutions in software and see if they can apply them to some aspect of the business to improve efficiency. Uh, and they will do this for all sorts of bizarre, strange reasons, um, mostly to kind of appear innovative for their shareholders. And so you'll see a lot of these things that are what are called press release where, where the corporate will do a project on a blockchain, not for the purpose of adding value to the company, but for the purpose of doing the blockchain project. So in Britain, there's the supermarket called Tesco's. They sell like food, right? Um, they did a blockchain prototype where they would like track, you know, produce that would come from the European Union on a blockchain. And they're replacing this very large old SAP system that they used to do it. Um, so they did this blockchain prototype, you know, it ran for like a month and they spun it down. But the purpose of doing it was to basically, you know, produce a press release to say that Tesco is using a blockchain. And that's really, I can't understate this. That's a lot of what you see in these kind of press releases. They're not really very real. They're kind of um, theater. Hmm. Gosh, I heard the exact same example for Walmart, I think, where they could track the, the lettuce going to Walmart stores in North America. Yeah, these projects don't really have a great track record. Now, maybe, maybe they're not as bad as the old thing they replaced, or maybe they're like kind of semi-functional, but like when we're talking about like tracking lettuce for some back office process inside of Walmart's like, you know, logistics chain, this is not a big transformative paradigm shift in technology. This is a way of, you know, tracking bills of, you know, lading for lettuce. You know, this is not going to transform the global financial system. This is basically just doing more back office data management. So. I think it's really important to not overstate that permission blockchains are not, they're not a big paradigm shift in our industry at all. They're just kind of a, maybe a partial solution for some very small problems. Hmm. Interesting. So let's shift a bit. Can you describe what a smart contract is? So a smart contract is a unit of logic, um, which you can think of as code, 
that lives on a blockchain uh, that mediates the transfer of the native crypto asset of that blockchain between different counterparties that use the blockchain. So the name itself is a bit problematic because smart contracts are neither smart nor contracts. Um, they're generally very dumb pieces of logic that have almost nothing to do with like contracts as defined by like common law. Um, so you can think of like, I don't know, the simplest thing would be like, um, I want to release some Bitcoin to you at some point in the future, like say 10 days later. So you can encode that kind of logic in a smart contract and say like, you should release these funds only after this date, right? And so a lot of these things are really that simple. And then there's more complicated ones that run on things like the Ethereum blockchain, which allow people to do things like create sort of um, like an equity crowdfunding structure in which basically a certain amount of the native token of the Ethereum blockchain, which is called Ether, is exchanged for like a positional value in the contract itself, which basically maps like a percentage of ownership in the contract, uh, just like you would kind of like a share in a company. Uh, and that's primarily what most of these things are being used for. They're kind of used for like crowd um, crowdfunding solutions where you basically allocate a certain amount of the native cryptocurrency to a position in a common enterprise controlled by a bunch of other people. And so in some sense, it's a way of doing kind of regulatory arbitrage, basically creating um, <laughs> basically like a cap table for like a corporate entity that exists outside of the regulatory perimeter and can pool money in this slush fund that the smart contract oversees. Are, are there any other useful applications for smart contracts? Well, the use cases that people would do are the ones where they want to transact in crypto assets. And like I mentioned before, crypto assets aren't only a great payment mechanism and they're a purely speculative asset. So, I mean, the use cases are limited to things that can only exist outside of the regulatory perimeter or things that are like straight up illegal, like Ponzi schemes or like, you know, gambling products that people want to do on the blockchain that have to kind of exist outside the regulatory perimeter. So I haven't seen a really compelling use case of smart contracts that was simultaneously compelling and legal. Hmm. Yeah. You've been watching this space pretty closely. Are there a lot of the, the other side, a lot of the Ponzi schemes and, and uh, yeah, well, stuff that's maybe not so good for the world? Yeah, so I would encourage everybody to go to, this is Crypto Skeptic, her name is Molly White. She does this really great site, it's called web3isgoinggreat.com. Um, and it basically enumerates like the day-by-day -day kind of catastrophes that happen in the crypto world. Like every single day, one of these kind of smart contracts or kind of new schemes or high yield investment fraud programs basically just implodes. And this happens like every other day now. And at the count at the bottom of the page, there's this giant like number, and it's how much money has been lit on fire. Now, mainly this is notional value, like it's basically pretend money that people are losing in these schemes. But like you know, it's sum up to like 15 billion, you know, equivalent of U.S. dollars in cryptocurrency. And like the stuff is really just a lot of bad stuff going on. And it's the wild west out there where there's a lot of scams, a lot of fraud, and it kind of looks like the 1920s again. And I think we all know how that ended. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, fr from your perspective as a as a software engineer, and this kind of relates back to the smart contracts, well, to crypto in general, the, this idea that code is law. Um, you obviously live in software uh, writing code. Does it make sense to you to to defer to code as law? Um, so this is the term that people use to describe smart contracts. We're like, if a smart contract does something, and we all disagree that that's like the law of the contract, then you really can't claim that there's any fraud or anything involved. It would be the equivalent of like, if I you know, do something on a smart contract and it spits out all of its funds to me, you know, it'd be like the equivalent of me walking up to somebody on the street and basically being like, mate, give me your wallet. And he just does and just gives me his wallet. Is that really theft anymore? It's basically the equivalent of that, but in code, right? So if the smart contract happens to like, you know, deposit, you know, $25 million into my account, that's what the logic said it should do. And there, therefore there's no crime or no fraud involved anymore. And that doesn't really match with our conception because if a programmer basically just made an error in the smart contract or the, like a hacker basically figures out like an exploit in the logic, and that happens basically every day now, 
then the contract's just doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, and this is not necessarily a great way to kind of <laughs> run a financial system because wow. you know, code and expectations don't always match. Hmm, that's really interesting. So one narrative out there is that while crypto might be in an asset bubble, the underlying blockchain technology truly is an, in, is an innovation and will be here to stay. What do you think about that? Do you agree? So from my perspective, working in the software industry, I don't see a lot of compelling use cases for the so-called underlying blockchain technology. That would probably refer to things like permissioned blockchains, which to be frank, I have not seen an enormous amount of use cases for. You have things like the Walmart prototype, but like it's not really a resounding success. Um, and every single company I know that's been in the kind of permission blockchain space has either folded or kind of just done sort of really bizarre kind of consulting work, building sort of stand-up prototypes for making press releases. Um, and so the underlying blockchain is really kind of a solution in search of a problem. And I don't see crypto assets being terribly useful because they're basically a suck as investments. They suck as a payment mechanism. They're basically just a way to spin up asset bubbles untethered to any kind of fundamentals or exposure to the broader market. And so to me, the entire thing seems like um, kind of illusory in its, its value add to society. Hmm. Yeah, it's, what, the comment you just made is interesting because if an, an uncorrelated asset might not be such a bad thing, but I think Bitcoin's actually become increasingly correlated with the US stock market over the last, uh, the last few years. It's got a, a very high uh, beta with with U.S. stocks, so it's not not even behaving like an uncorrelated asset, at least not not at the moment. Yeah, it's an open question about like where does the how does the price formation of Bitcoin actually come from? Because it's it's a pure greater fool asset, but it's not a store of value because the variance on the price is just too volatile. It doesn't act like gold, um, so it does not store a value. Um, it's not like anti-correlated with like the Nasdaq. If anything, it seems to be basically correlated with the Nasdaq. When the COVID crisis hit, it basically felt like everything else in the market. So what is this doing if you're an institutional investor? You're just adding beta to your portfolio, right, for no reason. Um, and as an asset, I don't have a valuation model for this thing. The value of it is whatever the next fool will pay for it is. Um, there's no fundamentals. There's no income. Um, so to me, this does not seem like something I really want in my portfolio. Uh, I don't know why people would want it from like a financial analyst perspective it seems very risky and not a whole lot of value add or diversification for that matter i agree with you one of the scary things that i've seen uh believe it or not is back tests including bitcoin but of course bitcoin has a relatively short and extremely positive for the most part price history that early on was uncorrelated with stocks <laughs> so it looks great in a back test and you can sell back tests so that's a uh, that's a little scary. <laughs> we uh, we talked briefly about Molly White's website. Um, Web three is going great. Can you describe what Web three is? Oh God, um, what is Web three? I mean, uh, nobody has a coherent definition that I've heard yet. If I were to back up and try to give the most broad definition possible, it's kind of the broad notion that. Um, crypto assets, NFTs, DAOs, and smart contracts need to be integrated into existing web infrastructure to give rise to new types of businesses that can exist that utilize blockchain technology. Now, I fundamentally think blockchain technology is basically useless, so I think this entire thing is kind of an empty buzzword, but that's what people in the industry kind of refer to broadly. But it has no universal agreed upon definition in the software industry, and it's considered kind of a controversial buzzword because it doesn't seem to be tied to anything. There's no company you can point to that's like the Google of Web3 or the Facebook of Web3. It's kind of a term that people use and throw around without a whole lot of thought to what it actually means. So hmm. does anything improve or get better with Web3? Um, well, the burden of proof is on them to build something that uh, shows some improvement over existing technologies. Uh, but since the underlying technology, like I said, crypto assets are kind of rubbish investments that have no fundamentals. Um, they're not great to invest in. They don't serve as a payment rail. 
blockchain technology doesn't really have an application. Um, it seems like it's building on a foundation of sand um, and it seems to be kind of a, a solution in search of a problem. So it's not impossible that some sort of broad umbrella of Web3 could have some value, but I think the fundamental technology it's based on um, has yet to prove itself. And I think there's strong technical and economic reasons why building on top of this foundation is problematic. What, what are proponents of Web3 saying will get better with Web3? So if you go to like the Wikipedia for Web3, I think um, there's a lot of kind of grand aspirations about either technical or financial reconfiguration that basically Web3 is going to bring an end to kind of the, the consolidation of the American tech hegemony. So the Googles, the Apples, the Facebooks of the world are going to be undercut by Web3 companies that are going to do everything they do and better. Um, this is a really great story because we all kind of recognize that some of these companies are just simply too powerful in the United States at the moment, and maybe they should be broken up or something that's going to be a debate. Um, so Web3 has kind of said like, well, we'll use the market to do that instead of antitrust. Um, and Web3 is basically, oh, what if we could build, you know, like a decentralized version of YouTube in which, you know, we pay out people not in dollars anymore, but in some sort of native crypto asset. And the financial, the, technical imaginaries of the entire project, I guess they imagine a world in which there's like a hundred thousand different types of private money, one for every single site you would possibly visit. So there's a YouTube coin, there's a Facebook coin, there's the Uber coin, you know, there's a Deliveroo coin, right? And everybody, instead of transacting in like pounds or dollars anymore, now you have to go through a gatekeeper in an exchange to buy the native token to basically purchase goods and services on the platform. And that there's also kind of the reverse operation that the payout structures can actually be, you know, they can pay out users inside of the native currency of the platform. So it's kind of the fracturing of like a coherent unified financial system into a hundred thousand different mini financial systems, all controlled by different gatekeepers and different rent seekers. And some people think that's actually kind of a utopian vision of the future. Other people think that's a very dystopian vision of the future because it introduces like a lot of exchange risk and rent seeking and artificial barriers to entry um, and transaction cost. Uh, but that's probably great if you're the one collecting the transactions, but probably not someone that you're paying them. Hmm. Yeah, I, I've heard that too, that the decentralization of platforms like YouTube, it gives power to the creators and all that stuff is a, that's the grand vision. Um, yeah. So you, you've kind of made your, your skeptical position pretty clear throughout our conversation, um, which has been which has been great. As a technologist, have you been impressed with or excited by anything uh, related to these technologies? Um, some of the ideas, the technical ideas, on a pure theoretical basis, are quite clever. Um, there are some interesting advances in like cryptography and some computer science stuff that has occurred as a result of this stuff. It's that fundamentally, I think when you apply these technologies to actually real world problems and like, you know, problems that businesses actually have, um, they tend not to really hold up because in most places, like completely trustless environments simply don't exist in capitalism. Like high trust societies are a good thing. And basically capitalism works best when there's like low barriers to entry, when markets have lots of you know, public information, when there's a kind of a unified payment platform that we can all agree upon. Like the dollar is a good thing. Like we don't want a hundred variants of the dollar. We did that back in the 1800s. Like it was called like the wildcat banking era where like every single bank would issue their own version of their own bank notes and everything. And it was a nightmare for most people, right? Uh, I don't think, recreating the wildcat banking era on top of the kind of modern platform capitalism is a value add for either consumers or for capitalism itself because it introduces all this kind of artificial friction to markets now. And as somebody that wants to see, you know, payments and money flow and like, you know, value being created and companies be, you know, you know, I want to see more value created, not I want to see more rent seeking from people that basically issue their own forms of private money, basically just to do the kind of business that we're already doing. So to me, this seems like it's kind of a very regressive project that seems to be kind of proposing that these new speculative assets simply should just exist um, for no reason other than people like to gamble on them. 
And so like the entire crypto project, I have a lot of problems with it, uh, both from like just a technologist perspective, from somebody that's worked on market infrastructure and somebody that's just interested in making capitalism work better. Um, to me, crypto, the entire project seems antithetical to all of those goals. And so I don't see much value. I mean, and you're pr pretty vocal about that. So I'm sure you've heard many, many counter arguments, maybe all the counter arguments. So I'm curious, what's the most compelling argument for crypto that you've heard? So I think the most compelling one is that there are, so like I live in Great Britain and like the laws of this country, I probably agree with like 98% of them, right? Because it's basically just like a liberal parliamentary democracy, right? Um, but most people in the world are not as blessed to kind of live in stable democracies across the world. Um, and so, you know, there are countries that are kind of authoritarian regimes that have very, very strict capital controls. And there are people that genuinely need to kind of like flee countries um, because they're either dissidents or because they're being hunted by authoritarians. Like, um, and, you know, perhaps like a crypto asset could possibly be of use for somebody that needed to like flee an authoritarian regime and then set up a new life somewhere. Um, that might be a use case that might have a very, very niche application for people that want to basically, you know, do the equivalent of like, you know, going on an airplane with a, you know, barrel of gold bricks and like to basically just start a new life in a new country. Um, so that's probably the most compelling one I've heard. Um, but like, if you factor in all of the externalities of this entire system existing, the value add to a very, very small pool of distance versus the kind of externalities and the cost borne by the rest of the world and society as a whole, in terms of just the amount of like illicit activity it enables, all the terrorism financing, all of the money laundering, all of the environmental waste. They don't sum to a, like a net positive on that. It's like helping a few dissidents versus having this massive, you know, massively destructive program that seems to be kind of creating massive amounts of suffering versus, you know, enabling a few other people to thrive. It just doesn't sum to me to be a net good for the world. What, what do you mean by the suffering stemming from crypto? Oh, because, you know, it's largely a vehicle for, you know, lots of fraud. Um, right. So like, yes, it helps maybe a few, you know, 20, 30 distance, but, you know, 100,000 people lose all of their savings. You know, does that sum to a net positive for the world or a net negative? I'd argue it's a net negative. Yeah, I got it. More suffering for more people versus well-being for a small number of people. It's a kind of utilitarian calculus that I'm doing here, but it's one that I think is substantiated. You were, from from what I could, could gather anyway, one of the earlier people speaking out skeptically about crypto and Bitcoin, at least at least writing about it. Um, I saw one of your blog posts uh, maybe a, a year ago, and I think you'd started writing much much earlier than than that. What has the experience been like being, you know, one of the one of the skeptics, one of the lightning rods for Bitcoin's or crypto skepticism? What's that been like? So I was I was early into the space. There's been a few other people that were before me actually, and like the people that kind of laid the foundations for um because at some point I was kind of more on the edge about the thing. But then once I really dug into it and kind of figured out like what's actually going on, like why the economics of it don't work from it being deflationary. And like, I sat down with a bunch of economists from the London School of Economics. We had this big kind of discussion and I brought my knowledge about the tech and they brought their knowledge about the economics. And we walked away from the evening being like, oh, this is really bad. This doesn't actually work. This will never work. Um, and so I kind of came into a long tradition of people that have already been speaking out about this, like um, from computer scientists to like other activists. Um, and it's been, you know, the community of skeptics is actually very, very supportive. And people like the Financial Times journalist, like the Financial Times has been talking about the downsides of crypto for longer than I can even imagine. And um, their expertise on the subject has largely been what shaped my perspective and their skepticism. And so when I started speaking out about crypto, it was like kind of a conversation between like five to 10 people basically thinking like, uh, is this good or not? No, it's not good. And then now, ever since I've been speaking out and like others have been speaking out, it's a lot, much larger conversation. And I dare say within my industry, like um, it's now one of the most controversial topics. Like there's very much like kind of a pro and anti-camp and there's not a whole lot of in between. You either 
it's like Marmite. You either love it or you hate it. Uh, and there's not a whole lot of in between because the ideas appeal to a very sort of certain set of political imaginaries about the world and markets and the state um, that tends to kind of divide people along sort of ideological lines. Okay, can you talk more about the genesis of the, the meeting with uh, the economist at, at the London School of Economics? Is that where it was? Yeah, I was at LSE. Um, yeah, so I had a friend of mine um, who introduced me to some folks in the econ department there. And then um, I had been kind of thinking about Bitcoin and the Ethereum and all this stuff and seeing if there was actually kind of any use case from a computer science perspective. Um, and my knowledge of kind of monetary theory and just like the, the whole central banking infrastructure and like how that whole system works was very much incomplete. Um, and so I really sat down with some guys who were really deep in kind of monetary theory and central banking and stuff. And we talked about like, you know, what are the desirable properties of money? Like what are the desirable properties about like you know, inflation targeting and how does central bank work and everything. And so it filled my kind of gaps in my knowledge about this stuff. And then we realized that basically as a currency, this will never work because it, you know, it's, it's fixed supply and there's variable demand. So there's no mechanism by which that will be equilibrium on this thing. And so if there's no equilibrium, then you have no price stability, then you can't do things like ever write loans. So you can never run a finance system on this thing. So it's currency is out by design because it's broken by design. And then as a speculative asset, like I know enough background in quantitative finance to kind of be able to like look at financial products and try to figure out like, you know, let's look at the cash flows of this thing and like figure out like where its demand curve is generated from and like, there is to be the demand curve is purely speculative and there's no income. So as a speculative asset, it seems dead on arrival. And so it looks to me like a bubble at that point, then it's just some tulip, which happens, but that's the essence of the conclusion that we came to together with our computer science and finance backgrounds. That sounds like a really interesting conversation. And yeah, the, we, we didn't cover it much in this conversation and, and, and we won't, but the, the whole, the misunderstandings about how banking works, the role of central banks, the role of commercial private banks, uh, it's, it's horribly misunderstood. And from what I can gather, that is, that is a big reason for, or, or it's a big part of the narrative behind, behind crypto. So that's in, in some of our other episodes in this podcast series, that's some of the things we're going to try and debunk. But yeah, I think that's, that's a key. So, um, Yeah. It, it makes sense that after having those knowledge gaps filled in, plus your technical knowledge, um, I, I, I can see how that would have changed your perspective. I think you're right. It's a very narrative driven asset. It's just the problem is that the narrative it's based on is this kind of like phony populism against the banks. And don't get me wrong, there's plenty of problems with the financial system that I could go into for days and days and talk about inefficiencies and corruption and everything. And some of those are real and some of those aren't, right? But people have to realize that the financial system that we have today works, like it works very, very well. And trying to replace that with this thing that seems fundamentally broken by design, but wraps itself in this sort of phony populist narrative about, oh, we're gonna overthrow the banks and like, we're just gonna burn down the financial system like a phoenix, something new will arise that will create this new utopia, to me seems absurd. Um, and if that's what's driving the kind of demand curve for the asset, then I think um, there's a hard reality that the people are gonna meet at some point in the future. and that the narrative around the stuff seems very problematic. And these are old narratives. Like they're, they're, they've been around for, for decades. I mean, since the, the creation of the Federal Reserve, there have been people who have spoken out very skeptically about what it is. And I mean, well, yeah, I don't, I don't want to get too deep into this now, stuff now, but there's a, a book by, I'm sure you've read it by David Columbia uh, that goes into the, the right-wing politics that drive most of the Bitcoin uh, narrative. It's that, that's a whole other very interesting rabbit hole uh, to go down. Um, so you're you're clearly passionate about about this. I mean, you've written a lot um, on a bunch of different mediums. Uh, you've been on other podcasts. You're joining us for this podcast. Why is speaking out about this important to you? Well, I would say a lot of the narrative around these assets doesn't seem to jive with my understanding about how the financial system works. It seems to be untethered to reality and it seems to be creating a lot of suffering in the world. And my fear is that there's some parallels that I see right here, right now with what looks like, you know, what we saw 
not exactly, but like what happened with subprime back in 2008. And like, um, I don't want to see this kind of bubble pop. And then a lot of retail investors basically just get completely wiped out because that would just be very, very socially corrosive, just like 2008 was. And I'm, I'm young enough to kind of have lived and come of age during that time period. And so like, I just don't want to see another financial crisis again. And everything I look at this, this bubble, and I don't see any reason why it's not a bubble. And I don't see any reason why it won't come to a very violent and catastrophic end. Uh, so I'm passionate about the fact that like, if I was, you know, a banker back in 2007, would I've had an obligation to speak out then? Yeah, probably. And I see kind of the same kind of manias and corruption, some kind of forces that gave rise to that kind of manifesting themselves in a kind of new form now. And anything I can do to kind of like slow the bubble down and kind of mitigate some of the disasters so that, you know, innocent people don't get wiped out in this whole thing. I think I have an obligation to do that and speak out about it. Hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Well, one of the other people that we're speaking with for this for this series has done research on uh, investors in Denmark, I believe, who in the financial crisis uh, lost uh, everything in Danish bank stocks. I believe that was their, their sample. But they found major impact on future risk taking for people that were burned uh, by those by those investments. So I think it's a it's a real valid concern, not only that retail investors will lose wealth, but they'll that they'll be uh, intimidated from taking good risk, like diversified, positive expected return type risk with their investments in the future, uh, which can have real long lasting societal and wealth inequality impacts. Absolutely, you know the biggest lie in finance is that like this time it's different, right? Everybody thinks that they're they're going to time the bubble, right? And uh, you know, timing bubbles is a negative something. Most people get wiped out, and so like um, people need to recognize that the difference between gambling and investing, um, and investing is not sexy. It's about um, you know long. You know, it's about time in the market, not timing the market. To quote Warren Buffett. Um, and I think there's a new generation of investors that have some very, very pathological ideas about returns and kind of massive growth in their portfolios that are not tethered to reality because they're trading these like super hyper volatile negative sum products that are mostly based on gambling. And my fear is that there's a kind of younger generation that's not, you know, it's ultimately going to hurt them when they kind of go get into their thirties and start buying a house and everything when they're, you know, all of their money is tied up in images of apes or dog money or something. And I, I don't see this, how this ends well for most of them. Yeah. I don't know if I've, I don't know if I came up with this or if I heard somebody else say it, but if you're excited about an investment, it's probably not a good investment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, slow and yeah. steady growth over time and diversification uh, and understanding the products that you're buying. Like all the things that Warren Buffett says about value investing or, you know, take those to heart because you know, <laughs> clearly he's done well for himself. So That is true. He has. All right, Stephen. Well, that's the end of our conversation. This has been great. We really appreciate you giving us the time. Take care, gentlemen. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. It's great.